Well, I hope you can hear me. I always talk too quiet and people say, I can't hear you, but um, let's give it a go. Um, so this is a paper about authenticity and I take as my starting point Umberto Eco's proposition that we live in a kind of new middle ages and that uh, um, our understanding of what authenticity is is very much similar to that of medieval times. In particular, I take from uh, Derek Pearsall some of the ideas about pious forgery which basically means that if your abbey or monastery didn't have a charter you created one but that wasn't regarded as being fake it was just it needed to exist therefore it came into existence and, and in a sense what that means as I'll conclude later is that authenticity is essentially a process um, and you create something, a piece of the true cross, it, uh, it brings about miracles and in the process it becomes authentic. Okay, um, my two uh, subjects which might seem a bit different but I think are very similar and the more I thought about this the more similar they become, uh, King Arthur and David Bowie. Um, as you may know, in uh, the 1190s, the monks at Glastonbury, quote unquote, found the grave of King Arthur, which is very convenient because the abbey had just burnt down and they needed the money. Um, in uh, January 2016, David Bowie died, and uh, this is the um, shrine, which I think we'll call it, we would call it a shrine. It appeared in Tunstall Road in Brixton uh, next to a mural <coughs> which was created by a street artist called Jimmy C in 2013. Um, I, I must admit, my, my <coughs> view is that King Arthur is largely a fictional character, following from a bit of stuff in some of the Welsh chronicles in the first millennium. Most of what's been written about him, including I've discovered a nice DC comic series taking King Arthur into the fourth millennium um, is basically kind of fictional constructions about who King Arthur was. And the thing is that David Barry was also, in a sense, a fictional character. I mean, for the first thing first, there was no such person as David Barry. David Barry was actually um, David Robert Jones, who adopted the name David Bowie, who in turn adopted a number of other different personas, including Ziggy Hardust and the Thin White Duke. You can see from the cover of Aladdin Sane, he saw himself as an actor, continually playing roles. And indeed, he was an actor in the sense that he appeared in films. He did a much, um, much praised performance of The Elephant Man on Broadway and so on and so forth. So in a sense, he was constantly constructing a kind of inauthentic um, theatrical personage for himself. And this extended also to, to, into, quotes real life. Uh, the bottom right slide, the famous scene from Top of the Pops where he puts his arm around Mick Ronson. In, um, in the beginning of 1972, he gave an interview with Melody Maker where he said, uh, um, I've always been gay, even when I was David Jones. Um, well, yes, he did have relationships with both sexes, but strangely enough, later in life, he then denied that he'd ever been gay. And as Auslander says, in a sense, he, he kind of performed gayness. But was he really? Probably not. Um, the other picture is the other infamous occasion when returning to uh, Britain for the first time in 1976 for a number of years. <coughs> he appeared standing up in the back of his car at Victoria Station and many people suggested that he was doing a Nazi salute. Now it's probably not the case that he was, he's just waving, but conversely he did make some fairly strangely right-wing statements at one time or another. So even in his quote-unquote real life there are kind of elements of the fictitious. Um, in terms of what happened to King Arthur, um, apart from uh, the Isle of Avalon, not so far from here in the Vale of Nice, it's claimed that he's uh, 
waiting under the Dennis Rock in the Vale of Neath with his knights and one day a bell will ring and he'll come out to save the kingdom. But which kingdom, I'm not quite sure, so, but I thought about it. There's also ambiguity about David Bowie's death, and I think deliberately so. I mean, I think he set out to create a certain amount of ambiguity. It would seem that he died at his apartment in Lafayette Street, which is top left as you look at it. But some people think that he was actually at his other house in um, upstate New York. There's also ambiguity about what happened to his remains. Uh, it seems that he was cremated in New Jersey and the official version was that his ashes were scattered in Bali, but some people have claimed that his ashes were actually scattered at the Burning Man Festival. Um, this, as we'll see, is not exclusively um, confined to David Bowie. It happens with other people as well. So, you know, lots of parallel ambiguities. And there are loads of plaques that have appeared to Bowie, especially since his death. Um, the top right one is in Berlin, where he lived with um, Jim Osterberg. The bottom right is unlikely playing with Maidstone for some reason. I don't quite know why. Uh, the bottom left in Beckenham, where he grew up. And the top left is interesting because it's put up by the Crown Estate in Hedden Street in London, just off Regent Street, John. <laughs> and um, it's a it's a plaque to a fictional character. It's not a plaque. To, well, it's a plaque to a fictional character played by a fictional character. Um, the principal shrines then that have appeared, particularly since Barry's death, they're not exclusively. The first one, Hedden Street, where that plaque is, um, certainly was a place where people went to celebrate Bowie as far back as the 80s, and actually probably a lot earlier than that, in the sense there's been graffiti there since the 80s, particularly in the phone box, although the one that's there now, on the left, is a K6, and as you can see, the one he was photographed in for the cover of Ziggy Stardust was a K4, and there was another phone box to it in between. So more kind of authentic in authenticity. Um, and I previously mentioned Tunstall Road. It's sort of connected with Bowie, and it's become the principal shrine. It's the one that everybody goes to. And its basic connection is about half a mile from where he lived, <coughs> in, from about when he was born to about the age of five. But, I think the, the artist only chose this location because it was a convenient place in the centre of Brixton where there was a wall that he could paint on and the owners of the shop let him do it. So the existence of the shrine there is a bit kind of coincidental. The third main shrine in London is in Beckenham. Um, in 1969, Bowie and the Beckenham Arts Lab organised a free festival centred around this bandstand. And in fact, not only is it a, a shrine that people visit on the anniversary of his death, but it's now become a site of an annual festival, which I think has been running for now about three years and seems to be destined to carry on as such. Um, there are other rock shrines. Mark Bolan, who died after he hit the tree in the southern my attic, didn't hit the tree, but that's what people say. So there's a big shrine there. It's owned by his fan club, or sort of fan club. The other slide, um, Gold is Green Crematorium, where he was cremated. Notice the little ceramic white swan next to the plaque. Uh, Amy Winehouse, there's a, a life-size statue in Stables Market in Camden, which accumulates more and more of these friendship bracelets. And this is one of four trees outside of her former home in the Camden Square Gardens, which were all covered with these tributes. Um, that is where she died of alcohol poison. Um, Freddie Mercury. Now, Freddie Mercury is interesting because there's a strong parallel with Bowie. Um, great deal of uncertainty about what happened to his remains, and deliberately so, I think, when he died. His home at Garden Lodge in Earl's Court had all this stuff on the wall outside, but within the past month or so, it's all been removed. Now, it was carefully conserved in the sense that it was covered over with polycarbonate sheeting and the owner, who was a friend of his, Mary Austin, obviously conserved it for many years, but then suddenly decided to get rid of it all. There's an English Heritage plaque 
to him in Felton in West London, recently erected. The one on the bottom left is interesting because that was <coughs> that in, um, oh Christ, I never remember the name of the cemetery in West London, but never mind. So this plaque appeared, again, probably put up by Mary Austin. And it may be where his ashes were, or maybe they're in Switzerland, whatever. And then within about a couple of months, the plaque disappeared again. So <laughs> there continued ambiguity about what, and what happened to the remains of Freddie Mercury. George Michael, probably the most recent, there's an absolutely huge kind of uh, park area opposite his former home in Highgate. There's masses, of, it's the biggest, the most extraordinary of all the shrines I've seen. These are just a couple of little fragments. Um, George Michael's different in the sense that he is actually buried in Highgate Cemetery, but in the West Cemetery, which isn't accessible to the general public. Um, is that clock right or wrong? It's wrong. <laughs> About 10 minutes. Oh, I've got ages, have I? Oh, great. I can waffle on then. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, if you're over in Highgate, it's well worth look. It's just an extraordinary place, really. Um, and in the sense that Bowie's a fictional character, there are, of course, shrines to other fictional characters. Here in Cardiff, if you go down to Cardiff Bay, um, there's a shrine to a character, Yanto Jones from Torchwood. There's an excellent chapter in John's edited book by Melissa Beatty, <coughs> all about it. <coughs> and it's, <coughs> sorry, God, I'm going to die in that one. <coughs> um, it's kind of become semi-official in the sense that from what started as people just leaving tributes to this character who died to save the earth from Torchwood, I can't remember which series, um, uh, there's a kind of semi-official plaque there now and it's kind of indicative of the way in which uh, we're beginning to understand this better and better as we work on this, Harry and I, that things go from the kind of informal to the semi-formal and then sometimes they transition into something else. So like in the case of um, Freddie Mercury, what seemed to be a semi-formalised memorial outside his home then suddenly disappears again. This has become kind of semi-formalised. The, all the stuff that's gone onto the wall around the mural in Tunstall Road, and there's masses, masses of graffiti. They've now put a, plas a perspex sheet over the actual mural, but that's been left semi-permanently by the owners of the building. But for all we know, they might clean it off next week. Um, so if you get the chance, pop down to uh, Cardiff Bay and have a look at Ganto Shrine, very interesting. A fairly recent one, um, the second series of Sherlock is in Giltsburg Street um, at the back of Bart's Hospital where Sherlock supposedly but didn't really jumped off the roof. And uh, this whole uh, side of the building is actually covered in graffiti, some of it rather strangely written in the dust on the windows which I thought was kind of interestingly ephemeral. As you can see, when I was there, I caught a shot of some uh, what I seemed to be tourists who were visiting this novel shrine. Um, then, of course, you had the Sherlock Holmes Museum, which is, you know, it's, I mean, it's a classic sort of Umberto Eco bit of faith in fakes in the sense that <laughs> it's not, it claims to be at 221B Baker Street, even though it's not. And in any case, there wasn't a 221B Baker Street, etc., etc., etc. The whole concept of having a museum to someone who never existed seems to me to be kind of intriguing. <laughs> um, one or two others. Um, there's recently been a Lara Croft Way created in Derby, because apparently that was where the computer game originated. The one on the right is part of the shrine to Juliet in Verona, where since at least the 1930s people have been writing letters to Juliet and local people have been digitally replying to the letters. And there are loads of those of these things stuck all over the walls near to the putative balcony, which isn't really the balcony. Um, and another one which takes us back into the 18th century was um, Young Werther. And apparently 
at the, at the time there was this huge mania about uh, Goethe's book and um, enterprising pub landlords in Germany would create sites which they claimed were the grave of Werther and which people would dutifully visit. So this idea isn't new. I think what we would probably say is that it's something which is becoming increasingly common but has a long history. Um, so, in all, I mean, when, uh, and our work mainly concentrates at the moment on Bowie, although we're looking at all this other stuff for comparative purposes. And uh, we asked ourselves, well, what is, what is the authentic Bowie shrine? Now, in this context, there's definitely a, a, a competition going on. Um, top left, that was put up on the Ritzy Cinema in Brixton just after he died. And bottom left, there was a plan to put up this huge Ziggy Zag monument, uh, which they didn't manage to raise the 900,000 quid to do. Meanwhile, down in Beckenham, as I said, they have this festival uh, every year, and you can get your Bowie Pizza there. And there's definitely a sense I've got from talking to the organisers that there's a resentment of, of Brixton claiming Bowie when he was really Beckenham. Um, I don't know, I don't know. Oh yeah, and of course Berlin has also put in its bid the ownership. Um, this is what the mayor said during the unveiling of the plaque. <coughs> So, there's a real kind of competition um, which even Maidstone has entered into to, in terms of claiming who owns David Bowie and where is the authentic David Bowie shrine. Now, at one level, I think you'd have to say that the people in Beckenham are probably right. <coughs> um, there's a quite nice line in the, the, the song he wrote for the TV series, The Buddha of Suburbia, living in lies by the railway lines. And I thought that, that, and I thought, oh yeah. So that house, second from the end, is where he spent most of his child, basically from about the age of five, 17, right by the railway line. And I'm sure that, you know, I, I'm sure he saw himself in many ways as a, a Beckenham person, very much a kind of suburban person that, as Simon Frist says, you know, there's a kind of, fluidity about suburban identity that you can be anything. Um, but you've got to say that the whole point about glam rock, which is what Bowie was one of the pioneers was, was this sense of its theatricality and inauthenticity. So if you contrast Bowie's, one of his Ziggy Stardust costumes, with the members of Free, you know, the, the authentic rock identity was the come on in the jeans and the t-shirt and, and be your real self whereas the whole point about Graham was to totally reject that kind of rockist identity and to deliberately be inauthentic so in a sense any sort of claim to uh, an authentic David Bowie shrine um, is a bit kind of paradoxical and in fact the whole of Glam was about inauthenticity whether it was Roy Wood's wizard Slade um, he whose name we may not speak, or the, um, the High Priest of Clam, Mark Bowley. <laughs> it struck me when I put this slide together that um, at least two out of these guys um, created the kind of iconic Christmas songs. Well, I don't quite know why Clam is the kind of uh, source of Christmas songs, but there you go. But all of it is about theatricality, inauthenticity. So, how can you talk about authenticity in the context of something that's meant to be inauthentic? Well, I think I want to say, and I think it kind of echoes slightly the, the previous talk, actually, is that authenticity is a kind of process. That's what the kind of medieval notion um, gives you. It's not something that just exists like something being just cut being white. It's something which kind of is made, but it has to be made out of the right things and it grows and it changes and the fake bit of the true cross acquires an authenticity and in a strange way David Bowie is authentically 
inauthentic and um, in that sense you know, that it follows Oscar Wilde's injunction that I've quoted here um, and I think that's all I want to say except that we've got a lot of thank yous um, thank you